Well, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're having a good week and studying hard. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that I do want to kind of mention just right off the bat that today's lecture should be somewhat short. So if you have questions that you still have that you want answered or like prior to the test on uh, Friday, that's I'm more than happy to stick around and answer questions for a while. Just don't hesitate to come up and ask, okay? Um, plus, since you know, obviously, this is kind of a little one off uh, lecture. Um, I probably won't make it like a formal question on any of the tests just because, you know, it's, it's interesting, but it's not like the end all be all of anything that we've done in here so far. But um, don't be surprised if you see like a bonus question or something involving something particularly memorable from this lecture. So, um, but yeah. Um, before we get started, does anybody have any questions about like the testing process or anything like that? Or just wants me to go back and, yes. So regarding quiz 11, I highly recommend that you take it before the exam. Um, it specifically has questions from uh, lectures 25 and 26, which up until this point haven't been featured in quizzes. So use that as an opportunity to obviously study for that. Um, yes. So with all the remaining exams, I'll keep everything hybrid because I don't, I, I'm going to keep everything hybrid. Okay. So you can take it online if you want, but I know a lot of people would just much rather take it in person. I know that there's a lot of different styles out here. And since this is technically an in-person class, I honestly, if I could get away with it, we wouldn't be hybrid at all, but it's just with the amount of people that we lose due to COVID or flu or whatever, it's just easier to split it. But yeah, we'll, we'll offer as both in-person and online. Uh, yes, please. Um, but honestly, if you just say something to me at the end of the class or whatever, right now, that's fine too. Um, just so I can just try to keep track of the numbers. Um, speaking of, along those lines, your final exam, I think it's December 10th. It's a little bit earlier than your normal lecture time, because keep in mind, basically, the way they do finals is based off of like if you have a block of time for each class, right? Say from like 12:30 to 1:20, like this one. Each one gets assigned its own like three hour uh, thing for the final exam. Now, I don't like cumulative final exams. Um, and to be honest with you, I don't think wasting y'all's time and mine by sitting here for three hours with a long ass test for nothing is that beneficial for anybody. So basically plan for my final exam just to be and it, it, the, the, the exam for unit four. I'm not going to be like, hey, you have to take unit four and then follow it right back up with final exam. So don't stress about that stuff too much. Yeah. Is the final going to be in here? Yes, it will be in here. Um, but again, hybrid too, if you want. Um, but yeah, don't hesitate to reach out if y'all have any questions. As always, I'm sure a lot of y'all that have emailed me already kind of figured this out, but I'm usually pretty quick to get back to y'all as soon as I can. Um, unless I'm teaching or doing something else, like I, I pretty much immediately email back, even uh, if, even if I probably shouldn't be on my phone in the middle of something. But um, don't hesitate to reach out and just ask questions. I'm always here to help y'all. Ultimately, my if everybody could get a hundred in here, that would be great. You know? Yes. Uh, it should be December tenth. And if you need to double check any scheduling things. That's on uh, web courses. There's that like info dump, like right at the top, that little info module. In there, there's the syllabus, there's the um, schedule for everything. It says like when our next connecting with biology assignments do, because you have one more of those left. But keep in mind too, there will be an extra credit uh, assignment for exam four as well. Um, this one will be worth a little bit more, but it's gonna require a good bit more work. So I try to make them relatively equivalent for what I'm giving. So it would be worth the full letter grade to think, potentially. So if you get it, it's 10%. Um, but it's basically going to be a little one pager description of some sort of organism that we've documented on campus. I'm trying to figure out like all the specifics of how to like assign different animals and all that kind of fun stuff. But once I have that all set up, I'll put it out there. So you'll have like the full month to do it. Um, so just keep that in mind. It'll probably be due a little bit earlier than the final exam, too, just so I have time to actually grade them and make sure that they're legit. Okay. Hey, yes. Uh, just to clarify, so exam four is going to be offering? Yes. Okay. 
Yeah, so exam four is just your regular unit exam like we've had in here. It won't be cumulative or anything like that. It's just plain old boring ecology. Um, yeah. Should be fun. Um, but yeah, so let's go ahead and get started here. Um, we'll go through our typical reminders as we always do. Again, quiz 11 is due on Sunday. Like I just said, make sure you take it before the exam. Uh, again, remember that the exam is this Friday, same time, same place. If you do opt to take it online, you can take it between eight to three, because obviously I understand that there might be some slight differences in like, can you get a hold of a laptop with you know a webcam in a quiet place? So I understand that that might be a little bit difficult for those that want that option. Um, and then, yeah, remember extra credit for exam three is due Friday as well, 11.59. It's really straightforward. And remember that you can use your observations that you took for your connecting with biology assignment, but you may need to probably go out and find some more stuff because the way it's structured is for the ex extra credit. Obviously, you have to, it's kind of like a scavenger hunt. You know, you have to go find very specific things like three different species of birds or a species of mammal, that kind of thing. So they shouldn't be too difficult. And if you're having trouble finding something, don't hesitate to reach out. I had a couple of people reach out about this where they're like, I can't find a fungi. I don't know where to look. And in like an hour, we were able to send them in the right direction, tell them exactly what you're looking for. And they found like 10 different ones. So it just all depends. Yes. So for, it, it kind of depends on what group, but for fungi, what I told that student, and it's probably gonna work out for most other students, go out and walk along a more, wet habitat and look for turnover logs and that kind of thing. Usually on those logs, you'll find those weird like shelves that kind of are circular and kind of almost look like an ear if that are attached to a like tree branch or something like that. That's the type of fungus. And honestly, the closer you are to wetter habitats where you're gonna see your like classic mushrooms and that sort of thing. Um, amphibians might be a little bit difficult but I found that if you go out after right around sunset and just kind of walk around, even your neighborhood, you'll probably find a few or southern toads. It's going to rain a lot, right? Yeah, that'll help. <laughs> that'll make your life much, much easier. But they're kind of fun too, especially if, if you find the like Cuban tree frogs or southern toads. There's nothing saying that you can't tip, you know, take a cute picture with it and post it to Facebook or something. Like, is Facebook even still a thing for y'all? I don't know. But uh, still, have some fun with it. All right, so with all that being said, let's go ahead and kind of talk about why did I have y'all do these stupid iNaturalist assignments? What do these actually equate to? What are they useful for? And so with that being said, let's talk about citizen science and community science. So the reason I kind of titled it citizen and uh, put both of these, these words up here, you'll see both of them in the literature nowadays. Citizen science kind of used to be more of the like, more of the accepted term until about the last year and a half or so, where now it's kind of being changed to community science. We don't, the, the big point of this is, is, you know, I may be a scientist, but I might also participate in citizen science as well. So it, it, it's kind of funky, but the whole point is like, we're, we're trying not to denigrate people and say, oh, you're just, you know, you're not a, bi a trained biologist, you're just out wandering around. Because to be honest with you, some of the most incredible naturalists I've ever seen were doctors, lawyers, um, some, uh, particularly one of the people that I worked with, um, who was probably one of the best birders I've ever seen. He was just like a janitor for the local, uh, for uh, the local university that I was at. But he'd go out every weekend and just go look for birds. And he was probably better than any of the people that were there taking classes on this stuff. So you never know who you, you might run into that might know this stuff a lot better than you do. So what exactly is it? So this is a term used to describe a wide variety of activities in which people who are not necessarily trained as scientists participate in scientific projects in a meaningful way. Obviously, you kind of see where that might play a role in the iNaturalist project, but there's a lot of different forms of this. Um, and we'll talk about some of those different forms in a little bit here. Now, the big thing is this often involves crowdsourcing. So, you know, you might have individually found 15 things at the Arboretum, but just based off of this entire class, y'all found seven to 8,000 different organisms out there. And you found like six or 700 different species. That's cool. And, but that's the thing is you need that crowdsourcing element where you just need to get bodies on the ground sometimes. 
Now, this kind of really started becoming a thing in the 1990s, but when you first kind of like start to see like the rise of basic technology coming in, and that's where you saw volunteers and amateurs who often contributed to some fields. It's typically stayed in the, bio, the world of biology because honestly, when it comes down to it, a lot of natural history is pretty easy to do for somebody that's just out wandering around. Because anybody can go and just see like a bird is in a particular location, right? It doesn't necessarily require a ton of expertise. Whereas running sophisticated uh, equipment for like a physics project or a chemistry project might not be the best idea for somebody that's never touched it before. So that's kind of why you typically see this group in particular. Um, but the, the big thing about this was is at that point in time, they weren't frequently as, not, as acknowledged as they are currently, where it was just kind of a part of things. Maybe some people did it, but it was more hassle than it was worth for a lot of scientists, so they just kind of ignored it. Now, however, as technology is advanced, it allows it for a lot more regular interactions with people, particularly just somebody that's not necessarily trained in science, to meaningfully participate in these kinds of activities. And it's all kind of, and you can kind of see how basically from like the 1600s up until now, how an increase in literacy, increase in um, just general, you know, basic high school biology knowledge, and most people now being involved, having some sort of college level background, all of that makes a huge difference. <laughs> so, why now and not exactly earlier? So obviously there were a lot of social trends that kind of drove this things like increased education and qualifications because I don't know if y'all know this, but you know there's a huge dearth of people that have like gone from barely graduating high school to most people graduate at least a two, with a two year degree in some sort of community college or something. And as a result, you have a lot more people that just kind of know basic knowledge about the world. So that helps a lot. Increased free time. We kind of forget about this in the US, but a lot of other places where, and you know, a hundred years ago, people were a lot more concerned about just living, not necessarily going out and finding things on their property or just walking around through the trail. And this is kind of a big problem in conservation because a lot of the places that we want to conserve because they're amazing from a biodiversity perspective, places like the Amazon or Madagascar, a lot of times it's not so much a, it's kind of a balancing act between meeting the needs for the people that live there, as well as preserving this land. Because we, especially as you know, people that live in the US, can't come in and say, oh, well, you're cutting down all the rainforest. We should tell you to stop. That's stupid. You have to actually address everybody's needs and make everybody feel comfortable that they're not going to die from starvation two weeks later. As well as the emergence of open science. You know, you have this just kind of desire by a lot of people to just make science accessible. Whether that's through little things like Bill Nye the Science Guy and the Magic School Bus, like how many of y'all grew up on that and have like a, at least a passing interest in the stuff because of it, right? All that kind of push to make things accessible. That's a huge part of it. And then of course, obviously you had a lot of technology trends. You know, the majority of people in the US have access to high-speed internet, whether it be at your home, school, public libraries, you know, Starbucks, just about everywhere you go nowadays, as long as you have a smartphone, you can probably connect to the internet, right? Um, as well as just mobile devices in general. How easy was it just to go around walking outside, take a picture on something on your phone, which automatically paired the time that you took it, the GPS location and all that information. So that way, all you have to do is just upload it to iNatural. You didn't have to sit there and poke and thought, prod through like four different things. That wasn't really easy to do, even with just basic digital cameras. That whole element of having that mobile device for your phone or whatever, it, it makes a huge difference. And keep in mind, like I grew up in the mid to late 90s. Like I was out of middle school or I was in the middle school by early 2000s. So not super much, not maybe like 10 years older than y'all for the most part. And even then, like I remember from like going to Disney and all that kind of fun stuff where a majority of your pictures and everything were old school film cameras. Imagine having to deal with that back in the day, like having to ship it off somewhere and getting it processed and all that stuff. Things like iNaturalist would have been completely useless and just not practical. 
And of course, the proliferation of DIY electronics. How many of y'all have ever heard of Raspberry Pi? Well, there's amazing things you can do with just these very basic, simple circuit boards and program it to do really cool things for very cheap, which allows pretty much anybody, if they want to, to put a recording device out on their property to listen for frog calls for like a hundred bucks at most. And all that stuff is really useful. You should see, um, there was a professor getting rid of a bunch of like old equipment about a year and a half ago. And for each one of these equipment boxes, it was a frog walk, <laughs> which is, you know, three different circuit boards, all from Radio Shack that had to be hand soldered together, a massive battery pack, um, just completely, and then it all fed back to just a simple tape recorder. So you didn't have to sit there and manually listen to everything to identify things. Whereas nowadays, all that stuff's digital. And that makes a huge difference. I mean, hell, there's AI algorithms out there that when you guys uploaded some of your, you know, audio calls, it was searching through and able to at least pinpoint the basics of this is a bird, this is a cicada, this is a squirrel, right? So obviously these technology trends make a huge role in all of this. So this kind of brings us back to like, what are our primary goals as scientists kind of interacting with the public, right? So ultimately each project has to balance between those scientific goals of scale and depth, as well as the benefits to the various stakeholders. So, you know, I, I, I'm not gonna make you go out there and survey and look for a hundred different things because you're gonna get bored and get frustrated with it. I might do that to my herpetology class because they know what they're looking for and they're being trained as biologists that should know those things. But by dropping it down to 15, especially with 10 of those being plants that as you notice, that wasn't that hard to get, right? Um, it made life a lot easier, but still it gave us a lot of valuable information about that plot of land because there were so many of y'all that were much more likely to be engaged than if it was a hundred animals or a hundred plants, what have you. So ultimately the challenge is that, you know, we have this very broad term that has a lot of different activities involved with it, different types of technology that you can use, the different scientific fields that can now be approached because obviously um, there's things that we could do now that makes some of the physics and chemistry projects actually viable as a potential citizen science project. As well as the number of participants in the length of time, both of those things really matter as far as like trying to fine tune, and determine how exactly you wanna make these projects work. And all this stuff was stuff that I considered when I was like, hey, let's turn this into assignment. Let's have a little bit of fun, get y'all outside and take away some of the weight of your tests. So it's not all tests in this class. Now, obviously there are a lot of different kinds of projects, everything from stuff like what we did, where you do like going out and looking for specific organisms to actually watching cameras and doing what we will be doing a little bit later with something called an ethogram, which is where you record the type of behavior that an animal is doing over a given period of time. And that can be really just valuable for a lot of different reasons. There's also, I think with that project rattlesnake cam, they actually monitor a bunch of different rattlesnake dens and count to see not only what kinds of organisms live in those dens as well, but what kind of prey that those animals are eating, all that kind of fun stuff. And basically looking for really cool interactions. Like how many of y'all knew that like the little pygmy rattlesnakes that live even right here on campus that get about that big, they're often killed and eaten by centipedes. Yeah, not something you would think would happen, right? But honestly, it's programs like this that allow us to see those kinds of interactions that we wouldn't necessarily be able to monitor normally. And that's why these things are important. So what is our specific, uh, what about our specific project? Obviously we use iNaturalist as our kind of data repository, which is great because what, each one of those pictures is probably what, between two to four megabytes. And we have 7,000 of them. That's just not practical, right? Plus you had that AI component that helped to identify stuff for you. So that way, you know, I wasn't expecting y'all to be able to identify everything, you know? Just, hell, I couldn't do that, you know? I, I'm, you know, I, I've spent, and I've spent a lot of time messing with this kind of stuff, it's hard. So why did I also, 
I had y'all walk a specific trail in the Arboretum or Whittier's Walk or one of the trails out at um, Lake Clare. Why did I do that? What was the reasoning behind that? Let's talk about it. So, oops, there we go. When it comes to measuring, so obviously our project is about measuring the biodiversity of the Arboretum, right? We're looking for how many species, how many different numbers of specific individuals for each species, that kind of thing. So it's really important to know if you have 100 Cuban tree frogs out here, that might be a problem, especially considering they're an invasive species and cause a lot of damage to the native amphibian community. Same thing with, out of curiosity, how many of y'all saw a brown on the river? Somewhere out the Arboretum, right? Pretty much everybody, they're freaking everywhere. But how many of y'all saw a green and all? The native species that's from yeah, one person, you know, like that's a huge interesting thing that we can talk about. And even in that more natural areas, you have this bleed over from places like campus and more urbanized areas into those natural areas where brown and are completely out dominating those green and where they normally wouldn't be able to in some circumstances. Now, one of the methods that we use to kind of define biodiversity in an area is something called walking a transect, which is simply that we just walk along a line that we arbitrarily define and observe all the biodiversity on that line. Now, in most actual projects, you'll plot this usually out on the GPS and it'll be just randomly assigned on the landscape so you can try to do a nice random sampling of everything. But just to make life easier, we picked the trails at the Arboretum in this case because that made more sense for us. I'm not going to have you go out and find random GPS points. That'd be stupid. Uh, additionally, we can combine this with things like quadrat, which are these little blocks here that you can lay out in the middle of the woods and basically say, in this little box, you have X number of plants of this species and X number of that species. And you can use that to kind of quantify things pretty easily. Then once you've got all this information, you can start actually calculating this basic metrics of things like richness which is the total numbers of species. So in our case, we had like 800 different species of animals that we observed. Or evenness, so how individual, evenly individuals are distributed among these species. So for, for instance, here in community two, we still have the same four species that are present in community one, but it's almost entirely dominated by this one species. Whereas over here, it's a lot more evenly distributed. So you'd say that this one has better evenness and this one does. And ultimately, this adds up an even more really obnoxious math. Uh, this one's called Shannon Diversity Index, which is taking into account the fraction of the total population of an area. So every single observation that we made versus the number of species and how many of those individuals that were encountered of that species. And we use all of that information together to kind of quantify and actually compare community A versus community B. I've actually had to do this for some of my own research where we were trying to look at the presence of disease on the landscape and saying, well, in certain areas where this is really high, our disease is really high because there's a lot of hopes. However, when that number drops off, the disease doesn't do as well because it's just not as many hosts. Usually it's a lot more smaller species that are able to use smaller puddles and things that don't deal with the disease as well. And as a result, we had a really strong trend for Shannon Diversity Index driving this disease system. And so you can look at a lot of these different things and all of them matter. So just some basic examples of this here. Here we calculated the number of species, the number of individuals, the proportion, all that kind of fun stuff. And then when you actually calculate that Shannon Diversity Index out, you can see that in this case, community one, clearly more even, had still had the same amount of richness, but Overall, this is the more healthy community that this one is. Now, we've obviously talked about like why we did things certain ways, but why do we do things at the Arboretum? Now, our, the Arboretum at UCF is a very special location. In fact, it's won awards for how well managed it is compared to a lot of other places. It's about 800 acres of campus natural lands, as you guys saw. And it's managed via something called prescribed fire. And they often go out and do removal of invasive species as well. Primarily plants, but usually if you're out removing plants, you might come across the brown and they'll take it with you too. 
And obviously it's home to just an incredible number of plants and animals that are native to Southeast Florida. And as a result, you guys got to kind of get an appreciation for what the natural areas of Florida should look like, right? You probably saw bushy blue stem, longleaf pine, slash pine, uh, different species of goldenrods, the liastris flowers that were really pretty, uh, Indian blanket, which was that really pretty orange and yellow flower. All of these things matter. And kind of getting to see that in person is a lot more tangible than if you just seen pictures of it or a video of it in here. And so one of the main reasons why I had y'all do this assignment is it's one thing to talk about biology, right? It's another thing entirely to go outside and look at it yourself. It's one of the reasons why when you talk about places like zoos, they still have an importance. Not only do they do a ridiculous amount of conservation work with captive breeding and what have you, I'd argue the main just perfect use for a zoo as conservation is just showing people that tigers exist. Because you can read in a book what a tiger looks like. You can see what they might look like on a YouTube video. But when you walk in front of that animal, and it's you know that much of a pane of glass between you and it, you're going to have a lot more of an appreciation for what that thing can do to you if you screw up. So, and that's why I like to kind of push the importance for things like this. So not only was it an excuse for y'all not to have everything be based on tests, but I think it's important for y'all to go out and experience what does ecology and stuff like that look like in Florida. Plus, you get to practice and actually see what is a vertebrate. What kind of vertebrates are out there? What kind of plants are out there? That sort of thing. Because, you know, I can talk about what a gymnosperm is, but that doesn't mean anything until you see a 150 foot tall, tall or long leaf pine and see just how massive it can be. And that part's important. Now, obviously, there are a lot of incredible diversity out there. Now, a lot of these animals we all might have seen, things like red shouldered hawks, which often come onto campus too. But a lot of these might also be a lot more secretive. Uh, things like the greater siren, which is a three foot long giant salamander that lives in some of these wetlands that during most of the year when those wetlands are dry, they'll bury down into the mud and completely encase themselves in saliva and live like that for a year for six months. Southern leopard frogs, pine snakes, those are really cool species. It's the second largest snake on the planet or in, in North America. And it lives right here on campus and you have no idea most of the time are pretty secret. Of course, how can you not love the fact that we have river otters on campus? Did anybody get to see some? No. They're, they're usually out there. Um, you want to see them go out 7 30, 8 o'clock in the morning and just go walk that big pond that's like right off that main trail. You'll usually see a bunch of stuff swimming. That's usually what they are. But, you know, we're kind of lucky in that regard. Not every, every place has this. We have bobcats, we have coyotes, we have deer, we have bears out there. And it's all just this little acre, 100, 800 acre property on campus that you have access to. Use it or it will be gone. How many of y'all have seen pictures of what UCF we used to look like in the 60s? Like just an aerial view, right? Notice how much of that is now all buildings and parking lots. And don't get me wrong, we really need more parking on campus. But we should be building up, not out. Obviously, there's a lot of good things to still preserve on this campus. How many of y'all found a gopher tortoise out there? That's a federally protected species. Maybe we should try to keep those on campus, right? I don't know, just a thought. Now, there are some other specific projects that the Arboretum is doing itself. And ultimately, by helping to find some of these things out there, you're kind of contributing to this a little bit as well. But all these different plants and whatnot, they're actually creating 3D models of them and plotting them out there so we can take a virtual tour for people that can't necessarily come onto campus and see these things themselves. Still not as good as the real thing, but it's something. Now, I have to put this bit in here. If you like gardening, working in greenhouses, or just hiking out on trails, they're a great organization. They are taking uh, volunteer applications now. Um, I have a couple of my undergrads that have been our, our volunteers for them for like three years, including getting paid as managers for them. So look into it. It's kind of fun. It's something different than working outside every day. And there's applications for beyond just being a, like a biologist, right? 
you can be involved with the plant sales side and get into the business aspect of it and that sort of thing. You can be involved in the agricultural side of things, which both has business acumen. There's a bit of a uh, psychology aspect of it as well, that kind of thing. It's all kind of neat. So some things to think about. Now let's actually look at the results of what we had. So I pulled all this stuff this morning. So everything should be up to date, ignore that one. But um, we'll actually look at the specific things we found, the crazy numbers that y'all found. It's really cool. Let's just look at a really broad scale perspective. Y'all found damn near 7,500 different organisms out on the, either the Arboretum or as a part of just being out on campus. And over a thousand species. That's awesome. Y'all realize that this is incredibly powerful. And it can be everything from, you know, just some boring plant species that we see everywhere to rare and threatened and endangered species that some of y'all found. Pitcher plants, gopher tortoises, eastern down in the back rattlesnake. A lot of y'all found some really cool stuff. So let's look at just kind of zeroing in here, just specifically on campus. Now, mind you, um, one thing to keep in mind with this is that with the, uh, the protected species, things like wood source, gopher tortoises, they often don't directly map the location onto them for obvious reasons. Particularly with gopher tortoises, unfortunately, there's um, some poaching issues as well as um, with development in Florida. If you have a gopher tortoise on your property, you don't want it there because it completely changes how you handle like developing that property. And it's kind of unfortunate, but it is what it is. But just look. Obviously, we covered these trails really well. But look how just well we covered campus. We probably know more than about anybody else about the kind of weird things that show up in these very suburban or urban habitats that we have no idea prior to, right? That's really cool. But let's just zoom in even more and look at just the Arboretum. So we're not including Lake Claire, we're not including Whittier's Walk, just the Arboretum trails itself. Now, obviously, you can see pretty well where the trails were, which is kind of cool. But this is also really valuable. You can see all of these different diversity, all of these different things. This is really cool. <laughs> and that should make y'all excited that we found all these really cool different things. Let's highlight some of those species here. Um, this is just a taste. I think I went down to any organism that had like seven, at least seven observations. But some things to point out, common eastern bumblebees. Y'all found almost a hundred of them between everybody, right? And some of the things we talked about in here, especially when we get to the conservation aspect that we were talking about in year four, what happens if those are all gone? You've got all these different pollinated plants that would probably cease to exist on the arboretum as well. So it's important to document where these things are and why they might be occurring in those places. Um, and it's not just the eastern one, you have the western honeybee, which has been introduced through a lot of these properties. So that's kind of cool too. But then you see some things like invasive brown animals, which y'all found 60 of them, which mind you, total there's about 300 of them. Most of them were observed on campus, but still to find 60 of them on the arboretum is kind of concerning too. But you can still see the dominant trees on the, the landscape that shape these entire communities of plants and everything around them. Longleaf pine, slash pine, cabbage palmetto, how many of y'all knew that we had a state tree before today? How many of y'all probably saw this and had no idea that it was a state tree of Florida and that's so important to our history? Right, it's cool. Um, and another kind of cool thing about that cabbage palm, it's called cabbage palm because it was a major food of resource, or it's a major resource for people that originally colonized both everything from the Calusa Native Americans to the colon or the the col or the individuals coming from Spain, the individuals coming from uh, Britain, all that kind of fun stuff. They survived off of that because it was really easy to dig up and eat. Also, gopher tortoises. They're called Hoover chickens because during the Great Depression they were really easy to eat. So, a lot of this stuff has more value than just being on the landscape itself. And has cultural or historical historical significance that are important to talk about. Let's take just a little quick snapshot of the vertebrates. We found 30 different, 36 different species of birds. 
believe 16 different species of herps. And again, one thing I do want to point out is that gopher tortoises are, are on here because of the weirdness of how they're recorded. It's still really cool species, too. Obviously, a couple of invasives, but people found cottonmouth, people found eastern diamondback rattlesnakes. That's awesome. There are very few places in the world that can say we have this on our property, and it's important. Um, mammals we did pretty good with. Um, some moles, some rabbits, deer, raccoons, possums, armadillos, all that kind of stuff. Obviously, a shit ton of squirrels. But hell, even some of y'all observed fish. How many y'all found the little eastern mosquito fish that grow about that big? Did y'all know that those are live bears? And are completely just like mammals have you know live young. That's really cool, right? Y'all had no idea that that was a thing. Y'all found five of them out there. That's cool. What was also interesting about those fish is notice the blue tilapia, originally from Africa, can completely out dominate our things like bluegill, sunfish, all that kind of fun stuff, eating pretty much everything. And those little sailfin cats. How do you think those got there? They're definitely not from the US, right? Why on, U on UCF's campus would you probably have a ridiculous amount of these things that probably came out of common aquariums, home aquariums? Yeah, exactly. So unfortunately, this is also kind of an indication of sometimes people are shitty too. And you can find those kinds of scars left on the environment too. So how exactly did these numbers compare to just excluding other groups? So Looking outside of our project, if you look at just everybody that ever observed anything in the arboretum, what did they find? So numbers-wise, we did pretty damn good. We're only about 1,200 off of that. But still notice 776 different species that they found versus the 471 that we found. We're still missing 250 different species of animals that we didn't see that everybody else saw. It could be a timing thing, just like some organisms come out at night. Some organisms are only in very specific areas of the arboretum, or some just tend to be a lot more secretive. A lot of different reasons why this could be. So with that being said, what were some of the flaws in how we sampled the art? What could have things that we could have done that if we were to go out and systematically sample this a little bit more objectively, how could we improve this? Exactly. Yeah, so one of the things that we could have done is gone through and systematically assigned specific trails, right? So that way we're not all just covering the same trail over and over and over again. But don't get me wrong, that still has value too, but it could have been a lot more beneficial to hit some of these weird little side areas, like some of the little marshes and the pitcher pit bog that's out on campus, that sort of thing. What are some other ones? Yeah. Exactly. When am I going to see a bat on campus? Night. When am I going to see things like um, foxes or frogs, stuff like that usually coming out? Dusk, right? So it all kind of depends on what time you're sampling things and all that kind of stuff. Which is why when I had y'all submit your assignment, I asked for the time of day. What's other, another factor that might have affected that that also influences kind of like what organisms might be showing up to be asked for? The weather. The weather. When is a frog going to be active? When it's raining, right? Why is that? What's a unique factor? Hmm? Perfect. Perfect. So amphibians, unlike reptiles, they can't be outside of water for that long. They have to keep their skin moist so that way they can breathe, right? That's why they need that extra water. And that's why you're usually going to find them out more when it's raining. Doesn't mean that they won't be out when it's not, but it's just a lot more likely. What about um, things like birds or reptiles? When, it's, when you're out there in the morning and you're walking along, they're going to be a lot less moving around, right? They're going to be trying to just hang out in a particular location, especially reptiles. Why might a reptile need to spend time in the morning just sitting somewhere? Yeah, they're ectothermic, right? They need that extra little bit of energy to get up and get moving. And that's why usually for things like gopher tortoises, they kind of exist as, um, they're really active during the middle or like right 
usually between like 10 o'clock in the morning and one o'clock in the afternoon. And then from four o'clock in the afternoon until like six. And the reason for that is it's too hot during the middle of the day and it's too cold at the other ends. So all that stuff matters. Now here were a couple of things that I came up with that could kind of change our design a little bit too. Things like misidentification. I don't expect y'all to know the difference between a Western and an Eastern honeybee. Shit, I didn't know until I was going through and identifying some of y'all's stuff. But you can see how that can kind of influence whether or not you see it's one thing or the other. And so I'm not an entomologist. I didn't know that you have to look for all those little stripes. I'm sure that y'all probably got sometimes a not so nice comment on one of your observations that were like, no, this isn't what it is. Some people are assholes, but you know, it is what it is. But still, like, I wasn't expecting y'all to know these things perfectly, and that's okay. Now, one of the things that in theory you could do is have people trained on specific things or only target specific things. So say, for instance, if this is the herpetology class at UCF, the herpetology class has to know every organism, both frog, amphibian, lizard, salamander, whatever, that lives in Central Florida. So in theory, they should be better at recognizing those things than y'all would. Not that y'all are intelligent or anything like that, just you don't have that knowledge, and that's okay. But, you know, kind of framing things around that. Then you have issues with species that are hard to detect. Why might, why might it have been difficult to find fish? Right? You're going out here looking with your phone to take pictures of them. Why would you not find fish? Yeah, exactly. You'd have to go out and do like hook and line sampling, you know, like regular fishing with normal people. Um, or go out there with same nets or something like that to really target that group. So maybe this kind of sampling isn't really good for them. As well as some of our more aquatic organisms like sirens and frogs, they're going to be much more reliant on those wetter habitats that you may not necessarily want to go trudge through unless you're bored and want to just go get muddy for the fun of it, you know? And that's okay too. That's fun. But I didn't expect that of them, right? But also, you can just have species that are hard to detect in general. None of these species were ones that we found in the Arboretum as a group, right? The pine snake, the bears, all that stuff. But that's not because they're not there. It's because they're really secretive. They can be hard to find sometimes. Especially things like bears, they may have massive home ranges that may dictate when you're going to see something versus when you're not. In fact, things like Florida panthers not to have you know, home range sizes in like the 50 square miles or so, which is crazy. And especially kind of understates that you need a lot of space for these things too. Yeah, just some things to think about. Now, I did want to show you all this. I didn't get permission to show this. But one of the coolest things about things like this is you may find unique interactions that nobody's recorded before. Now, here, we had a student that was out just walking with her dad and came across. Two gopher tortoises trying to kill the fuck out of each other. That's awesome. Like, how many of y'all even knew that gopher tortoises could fight like this? Right? Like, that's not something you think about. Honestly, gopher tortoises in general are really nasty animals if you think about it. Um, they're highly perverse, will hump just about everything. Um, as well as the males in particular. And you'll notice, and you can tell these are males, look, see that little nodule right underneath the head? They're called nuchal snoots. They're basically these big uh, triangular shaped specialized scale patches that are basically just giant bulldozer wedges that they can drive in and like puncture in between the heads and all that kind of fun stuff. Only the males have them. I wonder why that might be. Well, let's actually show this off here. You see where he's like driving that nuchal snoot into that other animal? These are probably two males fighting over either a burrow or habitat, although there could be a female in the burrow. I just don't know. Give me a second, just a little more up here. Thank you. 
know if y'all knew that gopher tortoises did that <laughs> or that they were on campus. So I know that this assignment wasn't necessarily everybody's cup of tea, and I understand that. But these things have value, and it's important to go out and look for these things because, you know, it's really easy for this to get turned into a parking lot pretty quickly. Not to put a downer on things, but all this zoned land at some point is planned to be a giant parking lot when you see it. This is an incredibly valuable tool for both y'all as students and for the animals that live out there. Please think about those kinds of things. Just something to keep in the back of your mind. All right. So and, and I hope for those of y'all that did this assignment, you got at least a little bit of something out of it. I know it wasn't everybody's cup of tea. And I know like a hundred people just chose not to do it. That's fine. That's y'all's grade, you know? Um, and I'm sorry if that killed your grade, but you made that choice. Um, but still, I hope y'all at least had a little bit of fun with it. So with that being said, go use this as an excuse to go be involved with these projects down the line. They're fun, or at least they can be if you make them fun. So take advantage of that. If you're just out hiking around because you like being outside, take a couple pictures. You never know what might be useful things you might be able to have that use for later on down the line. So with that being said, uh, do you remember that quiz 11 is due on Sunday, but you should take care of ahead of time. Your next exam is Friday. Good luck. I'm sure you're all going to kill it. Yeah. Yep, no, if, if you're thinking about the don't worry about the Just circle it on the paper. Yeah. Yep, yeah. anything that's in the connection with file needs to care of. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>